This week on Waterways. Illegal artificial reefs and solar energy on Loggerhead Key. Commercial fishing of the spiny lobster is a multi-million dollar a year industry in the Florida Keys. As is typical with industries that provide great wealth, there is great crime. For years, unscrupulous individuals have dumped trash in the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and Florida Bay in an attempt to attract spiny lobsters. These piles of garbage are called lobster condos, or casitas. The condos consist of anything from cinder blocks to office furniture to old washing machines. In a natural environment, spiny lobsters inhabit coral enclaves, hard bottom crevices, or sometimes they hide underneath sponges. However, if they happen upon a casita, they will stay there for shelter and protection from predators. The casitas have actually historically been used in a lot of um, undeveloped countries as a fishery um, for people who don't have access to boats and they don't have the equipment to li lift traps. In this country, where materials and technology are readily available, lobster fisheries are overseen by government agencies. Part of their role is to ensure that lobster populations are not depleted through overfishing. In the Florida Keys, the lobster fishery is regulated by um, the number of licenses and the number of traps that the commercial fishermen are allowed to put out into the environment. The majority of lobsters are caught in traps, which average about five or six lobsters a catch. Capitalizing on the lobster's predatory and cannibalistic behavior, the fisherman places a small lobster or other bait in the trap, and then places the trap on the ocean floor. Passing lobsters are attracted to the shelter, and once inside, they are trapped. Another method for catching lobsters is diving. Diving for lobsters takes longer and yields less, but not if you know exactly where to find them because you have dumped an old freezer or storage locker. These divers can score up to 50 or 60 lobsters on a single structure. Well, what casitas do is provide uh, shelter that's attractive to, to lobsters. Uh, consequently, it congregates them uh, in these habitats. Uh, this makes them easy target for commercial divers. Uh, and indeed, we've seen a slight but steady increase in the proportion of lobsters uh, landed by commercial divers uh, relative to trappers uh, over the past four or five seasons. A greater proportion of divers are catching lobsters. However, the diving technology used to catch lobsters is unchanged. While populations directly suffer from lobster condos, there is much collateral damage. A lot of these things are not properly cleaned. They may contain uh, pollutants such as petroleum products. Um, they're also very, um, some of them very lightweight in the sense of, um, not that, that I could pick them up, but in the sense that a strong storm or a hurricane that passes through can actually move these things. Juvenile lobsters live in the Gulf of Mexico and Florida Bay. When they reach maturity at about two to three years, they migrate back out to the Florida Keys reef track. During this migration, the lobsters will spread to shelters, under sponges, or in reef patches. We feel that concentrating these, these, or these animals in such a way and exploiting the, them through the fishery, the commercial catch of these, um, we're not only putting pressure on the, the lobsters themselves, but we feel like we, it's possibly changing the reproductive ecology and life history of, of the Florida spiny lobster. With documented proof of the dangers of lobster condos to the marine environment, enforcement of laws against illegal dumping is necessary. 
Individuals who dump trash illegally have many enemies. If it's not permitted, it is garbage, basically. Uh, and they will prosecute it. And that also extends to any other officer within the state of Florida that has state jurisdiction, whether it be Key West Police Department, Monroe County deputies, uh, anyone on the water can enforce that. In 2001, Florida law enforcement caught a pair of individuals dumping illegal materials into the ocean. What they found horrified them. What happened was that they, con they actually confiscated their GPSs and um, downloaded the numbers. We were suspicious that many of the numbers located in these individuals' GPS units were possibly areas that the structures they put out there were illegal. They were not legal traps. Much of it consisted of um, cut up dumpsters, there was old bathtubs, car hoods, um, corrugated metal, um, as well as wonderboard and PVC filled with concrete. cut off pieces of dumpsters, uh, wash machines, bathtubs, refrigerators, uh, old tanks. Uh, the latest thing is uh, pieces of wonder board on uh, PVC, small pieces of PVC pipe that supports it. And uh, none of that is legal to put in the water at all. What we did is we documented each individual piece um, using techniques that we use in our injury assessment um, procedures. Um, each piece was measured to determine the extent of the environmental damage caused by the placement of these structures on top of live communities such as seagrass and hard bottom. So far, we've pulled out 65 tons of, of debris that was put in the water. And this is only from two cases. Uh, we know there's more out there, but it's just a matter of investigating and finding out who's putting it in. Now we have enforcement uh, on the water all the time. Uh, we uh, have enforcement on land too and we see some of this stuff piled up and uh, we can kind of associate it with uh, the different people that are putting it in. So uh, we, we keep a pretty good eye on night and day on what's going out there. There are probably hundreds or thousands more illegal structures out there that we are unaware of. If you add up the hundreds of locations that we went out and dove and took a look at and added them all together to see what kind of environmental damage was done, um, we were pretty overwhelmed. Within this regulated industry, there is an allowance for artificial reefs. Both the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and the Environmental Protection Agency issue limited permits for artificial reefs. The artificial reefs that are permitted through the sanctuary in the state of Florida are highly scrutinized in various ways. Um, the material which the artificial reef is made out of um, has to meet certain guidelines. Um, they have to be clean of any kind of contaminant that may cause um, environmental concern in the present or in the future. A lot of engineering is, is looked at as well. Uh, coastal engineers take a, a good look at um, the wave dynamics of the area where these artificial reefs are put down to ensure that these things will not shift in the event of a major storm or a hurricane. The 
dangers from unpermitted artificial reefs are many. When an artificial reef is legally placed, a survey of the seafloor is required to ensure that the bottom is barren. People who heave garbage overboard have no regard to the impact they are causing on the marine ecosystem. Legal fishing for the spiny lobster is a livelihood for many families in the Florida Keys. As in other industries, those who break the law make it harder for honest citizens to make a living. The people who are practicing this illegal fishing are not only causing ecological and environmental problems, but uh, socioeconomic problems as well. The, the fisherman who is out there day in, day out, pulling his traps, trying very hard to um, you know, make a livelihood with his permit um, and, and, and do it by the rules, is being impacted far greater than I can even imagine. While one boat fishes legally, his neighbor may have an unfair advantage by fishing habitats illegally placed. It isn't the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission that is hurt, but the spiny lobster and those who make a living by the rules. The number of lobsters caught in the Florida Keys in 2001 was the lowest in almost 25 years. The causes of this drop are uncertain, but the effects of lobster condos on a struggling industry could prove to be devastating. Uh, some people may think that the only way they can be caught doing this is by putting, actually being caught putting it in the water, but that's not the case. Uh, just the simple fact that they have it in their boat or they're towing it out behind their boat is enough for prosecution under uh, state statutes. While there is no irrefutable proof that casitas keep lobsters from propagating, there is undeniable evidence that unpermitted artificial reefs are damaging to the marine habitat and lobster fisheries. The greed of a few could mean disaster for many. The dumping of anything in the ocean or bay is illegal. Lobster condos wreak havoc on coral reefs, seagrass beds, and especially lobster populations. Those who sneak around in the dark of night are committing a crime against their neighbors, the marine environment, and the spiny lobster. Loggerhead Key, part of the Dry Tortugas National Park, has been the gateway to the Gulf of Mexico ever since the first mariners traveled here. Almost 70 miles west of Key West, Loggerhead Key was named after the turtles that nested there. In 1858, a lighthouse and quarters were built, which served as a major navigational aid to all shipping that went through the area. All cargo flowing down the Mississippi and traveling to the East Coast would pass the Dry Tortugas to the Florida Straits. Loggerhead Key was also home to one of Florida Key's first marine research centers. The Carnegie Institute had a wildlife research center on the north end of the island, and although the facility itself was destroyed by hurricanes, a small remnant of the site remains. Today, the lighthouse on Loggerhead Key serves as a monument to all those intrepid pioneers who braved the harsh conditions of the Tortugas in order to defend the nation's borders and explore the unknown. Everglades National Park, who is responsible for the upkeep and maintenance of this historic site, has undertaken efforts to bring Loggerhead Key into the 21st century while preserving its historical integrity. In 2002, Everglades National Park contracted Sunwise Technologies to eliminate the diesel-powered energy system on Loggerhead Key by designing and installing a 14.4 kilowatt solar hybrid system. Sunwise Technology was hired to provide Loggerhead Key with a hybrid solar electric propane generator electrical system to run the island and eliminate the use of diesel fuel on the island because of the high maintenance costs of generators, the cost of shipping diesel fuel out to the island, 
st and storing it in tanks that will eventually leak diesel fuel onto the island. The solar array is supplemented by a propane gas system. Operation of a hybrid system will reduce fuel consumption from 10,000 gallons of diesel per year to 392 gallons of liquid propane per year. The system provides power for employee housing including air conditioning, refrigeration, and potable water production. Presently, um, the power generation right now is all from diesel generators. They have three diesel generators, um, and they cycle between the three. One of them runs for a full week, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and then they turn that one off and start the next generator. And that cycle just continues and continues and continues. There's a couple 1,500 gallon diesel storage tanks on the island and I believe they have to bring fuel out a couple times a year. But it is a difficult operation. They've got to pump diesel fuel from the boat on the dock up to these tanks and when the weather's rough, the sea's going, diesel fuel's spilled. Um, and that's, a, that's an environmental hazard and also the high corrosive environment does a number on the tanks and there's a good likelihood that uh, those tanks will need to be replaced periodically or they'll start to leak and at 1500 gallons if it's a slow leak you may not notice it. With the renewable energy source of solar power Everglades National Park is embracing new technologies that help sustain the integrity of this pristine environment. Whenever a new development occurs in public lands, a review process is undertaken to uphold the integrity of the park. The uh, Historic Sites Act requires all federal agencies to notify the public, other state, local agencies of an action that they're about to take. And in this case, uh, with the solar array system uh, in place, um, the federal government, what it has to do is uh, to go through a process that uh, ensures that the public as well as other agencies are able to review what's going on out here and uh, have a say into the development of the project. Part of the development process includes preserving the island's rich heritage. Loggerhead Key housed a quarantine hospital during the Civil War. During its rich history, families lived and died on the island while serving in the Coast Guard. Everglades National Park now acts as protector of this heritage. In preserving this area, there's a number of things to consider. If, uh, if we really wanted to restore these, uh, these buildings and these facilities to the 1921 era, uh, we would have to find doors and windows that were built and are still preserved from that era. That would be a true restoration project. Uh, since probably not many of those things exist right now, we're going to repair some of the facilities and we're going to replace uh, some of the artifacts that uh, are here. When we do that, we will replace them uh, as they were originally designed and with the same material. Uh, they will be rebuilt with in-kind material. Ron Dorsey is an Everglades Park Ranger who specializes in restoration projects. Through studying archives, old photographs, and the historical context of the construction, he can determine the materials and methods of the original builders. What we hope to accomplish by uh, preserving the keeper's quarters over here is to basically replace uh, things that have been destroyed over the years, um, things like the roof, like the windows, like the doors, not only will they be uh, replaced, uh, restored uh, as their original design called for, but also with in-kind materials. Um, in 1921, um, probably the material of choice would be cypress wood for, for doors and windows. And uh, the new windows and doors that are going in there will be made of, of cypress. Uh, and they'll be the original design of six over six double hung windows. While park rangers attend to the preservation of history, Mike and his crew focus on the elimination of a part of Loggerhead's history, the island's dependence upon diesel fuel. One of the first steps for Mike is to find the proper placement for the panels. 
For optimal sunlight, the location must be free from shadows throughout the entire year. We use an instrument called a uh, solar pathfinder, which is this little glass dome with a magnetic compass on it. And you aim the compass so that you're looking due south. And, it, and by looking into the glass dome, you can see the shadow of all uh, objects that may cast a shadow on that location. And it shows you at what time and what, at what month of the year that shadow is going to be there. If you're in the southern hemisphere, you want to face the solar array north. Being in the northern hemisphere, these panels will face south. The panel's angle of tilt is directly related to the location's latitude. The angle of tilt should roughly equal the degree latitude. Once the solar panels are in place, virtually no maintenance is required. Every so often, the park rangers must wash the panels, keeping them free of dirt and debris. Compared to the transport of diesel fuel, the solar array is a caretaker's dream. It is also an environmentalist dream. With diesel generators, park staff had to transport large amounts of fuel from the mainland by boat. Although spills never occurred on this journey, they were always a possibility. Due to the cost of transporting fuel from the mainland, operating a diesel energy source on Loggerhead Key is 10 times more expensive than it would cost on the mainland. While the cost of conversion to a solar energy system was substantial, as Mike explains, the cost of fossil fuels are substantially more. How much price do you put on the amount of CO2 that the power plant is releasing into the atmosphere? How many nitrates, sulfates? Uh, how, many, how much increased respiratory uh, illnesses or chance of illness in surrounding areas from power plants are you willing to accept? I mean, what's the cost of that? Nuclear power doesn't produce the emissions, so it does have that one advantage. However, there's a very big problem in the storage of radioactive waste. Solar electric does not have any emissions and no toxic waste. While solar energy has been around for decades, the demand for fossil fuels continues. Everglades National Park is leading the way for a cleaner environment while simultaneously preserving our heritage and history as a people. <laughs>